Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, welcome back. Hope you all had a refreshing break. And you are ready to continue with Jupiter. Uh, I'm uh, Diana Yushan. I'm uh, going to be teaching this uh, lesson together with Jarno that you've already heard earlier today. Uh, we'll go through uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, yeah, ho hope you're all ready. Yeah. Okay, so um, like the idea is for this session is again, um, a good number of demonstrations. We'll look at Jupyter and Jupyter Lab and talk about notebooks in general. So, um, you might already know what no, uh, notebooks are, how they how they are used. They're a common way of sharing uh, sharing research software and sharing the results of that software. So they are they are a good way of um, of doing of implementing reproducibility and collaboration, reusability of code. Um, exactly. And uh, if I may add, I mean, for those of you who are already very familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you might find this very basic. So, uh, Jan, if you scroll down a little bit uh, on uh, on this page, so under uh, optional ex episodes, you see some, uh, some examples of more advanced Jupyter features, which you may find interesting. So, again, if you know a lot about Jupyter, then uh, you might find that... Uh, um still interesting enough yep. but yeah so i mean we'll see relatively basic usage but it the thing i think the main take-home message is more about how notebooks work how they are useful and how they're not useful like what are the caveats and it also this is about jupiter we'll be demonstrating with jupiter but this these points mostly apply to all other notebook interfaces as well um, yeah, exactly. So maybe, I mean, we are going to demonstrate Python codes in uh, this uh, lesson, but if you're working with uh, with other programming languages, it's still possible to use uh, Jupyter and we'll talk uh, a little bit about that. Yeah. And maybe one comment, so let's address the big elephant in the room. So why actually use uh, Jupyter Lab instead of other codes like Visual Studio Code that we've already uh, touched a bit upon uh, um, earlier so uh, I would say it's really a matter of preference if uh, if you are coding in uh, Python then uh, Jupyter lab is uh, is fairly common uh, you can use it again with uh, with other programming languages as well but in the end it's really up to you what you have avail available on your computer you might even like to try different tools and see uh, which one you like the most and you find most useful Okay, so yeah, um, I'm not 100% sure this is true. I think I've heard it actually in Code Refinery somewhere, so maybe it, maybe it is. Um, Jupyter, uh, is, it's so bold. What I've heard is that Jupyter, the name comes from Julia, Python, and R. Um, and so Jupyter definitely supports Julia, Python, and R. Um, exactly. So kernels exist for those languages and you can run any general commands in Jupyter, but um, it is designed around those languages. Yeah, I mean, now there are also uh, kernels available for uh, for Fortran and C and uh, Mathematica, whatever, they're really like uh, more than a hundred different kernels that you may use, but um, some, uh, some uh, uh, I mean, Julia, uh, Jupyter notebooks may be most useful for uh, for Python or in the Julia, if I may choose. But again, yeah. it's uh, there are lots of different options. Okay. Um, so what is Jupyter then? And what are notebooks? Um, so I'm not sure if how visible this is. Um, well, um, you don't need to actually see the code. Um, but which one is easier to follow? Um, here's a description and then example one here um, that gives the code to follow this, um, uh, gives the, the code um, that does uh, runs this example. Um, 
or here another option where instead of essentially a script with some comments you have um, <coughs> you have some formatted text uh, explaining each of the um, well sections of code and this is um, this is a rhetorical question. I mean, almost certainly this is easier for most people to follow. It looks nicer. It has some formatting. And um, so the code is still displayed as code and runnable as code, but it's like interspersed with this um, formatted uh, formatted text blocks that yeah, I... explain what's happening. Exactly. I mean, I like, uh, I like a lot the syntax highlighting. Well, now you have it in both examples, but uh, sometimes uh, you need to do some additional things in order to enable code syntax highlighting in your regular editor. So Julie Peter Lab does already that for you, and I do like that uh, a lot. Also, I like the fact that you can really add documentation to your code together with uh, with uh, with the code. Um, uh, code lines and also the fact that you can break it a little bit into pieces it makes it much more readable in my opinion so it's great for uh, definitely for well for uh, shorter um, shorter uh, scripts or uh, programs okay so that is the basic idea there's um it renders text and then includes your code and the results of that code in between um, so it's like a notebook you write down, um, actually, I think, is there, um, do we have that image of the notebook? No. Oh, well, I mean, if you're doing this old fashioned way, you would be like looking through a telescope, for example, and scribbling notes in a notebook, and then maybe drawing a picture, and uh, then writing some equations and so on, like doing, solving the equations as you go. Um, so this, this is the same idea, you can write text, and then you can do computational stuff and display the results of that computational stuff in between the text. And it really looks like a notebook and behaves like a notebook. Okay, so um, so he, uh, yeah, okay. So this interface, this notebook-like interface, has been used in a lot of other places. Um, Jupyter doesn't have any sort of um, uh, exclusive right to it or anything. So there's uh, there's plenty of places that use that, and uh, it it really works quite nicely. Um, I don't actually. So I I know you can do um, you can edit Jupyter notebooks directly in VS Code. Uh, so I'm not sure if this means that or something else. Yeah. So um, you need uh, you need to install an extension. Yeah. Uh, but it's easy i would say or i mean it's well yeah, I mean, documented as well and yeah. uh, in principle you can uh, you can do the same thing we are doing in this uh, lesson in vs code so it's yeah. again a matter of reference and yeah. what you have available to you yeah, because in vs code essentially everything works by extensions installing another extension is not a problem uh, yeah okay so there's some case examples here you can look through these um also in your own time, but um, for example, was it true here? Um, you can take a look at an existing notebook. Um, oh, here is this binder link, I think, okay. So um, we will actually have a section where you, where we demonstrate creating a, um, creating a repository and then looking at it through binder. But here you can quickly take a look once it's well, not quickly because it takes a while to start the kernel. But it will install all the requirements from the requirements.txt or um, in other languages, there's environments and runtime txt. Yeah, hmm. and I think I and mean then, this is yeah. yeah, this is actually one of the strengths I I see in, when it comes to working with uh, Jupyter Notebooks, the fact that it's easily shareable to other people. You can make sure that you can ship your code uh, together with the requirements uh, that uh, you yeah. need for that work. And you can uh, easily show it to someone else and you don't even have to, to have your computer with you 
your own computer with you. You can just grab it from GitHub or some other uh, place where you you have your code. So yeah. that uh, makes it uh, makes your code very accessible. Okay, let's check back on that later. But yeah, so they have actually they've created these notebooks and then they have set up a repository on GitHub so that you can um, essentially you can repeat their re, uh, their results and you can read through their description while you are repeating those results. So that's really nice of reproducibility. Yes, uh, another example. Um, so you can also launch this in Binder and um, a gallery of more examples. There's a lot of these. Okay, so what is um, what is Jupyter good for? What are notebooks good for? Um, so if you're describing a linear workflow where you want to kind of you want to describe it and at the same time demonstrate what's going on. Um, you want to display your results, your uh, research results. That's a very good showcase or a, a script that reproduces your research results. Um, it's also really good for experimenting. So you can go and change a piece of co a part of the code and rerun parts of it without having to do the entire analysis from the beginning. Okay. And yeah, it, it can also be an, well, it's an interactive development environment for code and visualization and so on. It can also be, um, you can now have a, it running on a server or you can run a server and then multiple people can edit at the same time, which is really nice. So yeah, it, it's great for uh, sharing your code, sharing your workflow, sharing your results, teaching and so on. So students can go and change the code and see what happens. That's also really nice. Yeah, I especially like it when producing figures because I, I always find it takes a lot of time to find good yeah. settings for a figure and the fact that it's so interactive makes it very useful. So, yeah. so now this example is done. Um, there is an index.ipython notebook, which I'm opening. Yeah, so maybe and... you can comment a bit how you actually got to this uh, window. Uh, well, I mean, once I, I mean, I click through here and click the binder link. And once it was done, it actually automatically went into this window. Okay, so now so, you uh, are having... I'm on using... binder now. Um, okay, so, uh, so you have Jupyter I mean, Note. Yeah, it kind of did it automatically. So I, I will open my own local version of uh, this interface. This is uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, in a moment, but now, now um, I guess the point is to mainly to display this, um, to show everybody this uh, notebook about gravitational waves. So I'm not going to run anything here, but the results are already there. Um, so you can have there's some titles, some description, and then you can see the data, the raw data, and how they uh, progressively. Um, uh, they um, work on the data and get a final result. Uh, so, okay, I'm leaving that. So yeah, the, so this is um, the gravitational wave, the first gravitational wave discovery, uh, looking at the original data and the uh, the result. So you can reproduce the, from the raw data, you can reproduce the plot in the paper, which is really nice. Okay, so some pitfalls. Um, so if you have nonlinear code flow, which basically means calling functions and for loops and functions calling functions and so on, something complicated, um, then Jupyter is probably not going to be very clear. Um, so it's, I mean, you can still use Jupyter and you can define m most of the functions outside in a module that you import that and uh, I mean, we will do that, I think, in this uh, this demonstration. Um, so, the, so the main thing there, of course, is ex to explain what the function is doing and uh, have a good readable name for the function so that people reading the notebook understand what's going on. Okay, it doesn't really work well with large code bases. 
Um, essentially, when you're running one Jupyter notebook, it does not interact with another. So you have essentially just one file and everything else you need to import as a module. Uh, yeah, and uh, tomorrow we'll actually have an example during the automate. Uh, sorry, during the modular co-development uh, lesson on how you actually at some point need to to leave the Jupyter notebook interface and move to uh, to something else, be it uh, running in the command line or using other tools uh, which uh, make uh, larger codes uh, more suitable. Yeah. So, um. In Jupyter specific, for Jupyter Notebooks specifically, um, they are JSON files and they include images and so on. So it's not straightforward to write one in a text editor. And of course, it, you cannot run um, the cells in, a norm, in the pure text editor. Uh, the text editor has to support running, uh, well, Jupyter Notebooks directly. Um, so that, um, that can be a limitation. Um, Notebooks can be version controlled, but if it includes images or like big data files, that can be still can. Uh, there are some limitations um, for version controlling notebooks, um, and uh, specifically for Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, notebooks are not named by default. You need to remember to name them, otherwise you just have unnamed .ipython notebook, which is a bit unclear. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of, um, there's a bit more pitfall, uh, pitfalls listed here. I think the biggest one though is that you can run cells out of order, which does make development easier. So if you change something in the beginning, you don't necessarily have to run all the cells, but it means that the state of execution is not clear. Or the state of your program is not clear from the text what that you see, especially if you, while you are developing it. So that can always cause problems. Um, if you run, if you write a bunch of cells and then you run them in some random order, you will get weird results and you can do that. Okay. So it is a good idea to, uh, before saving your notebook and before sharing any results, it's a good idea to run all the cells in order and then save so that when someone else opens the notebook and tries to run stuff, um, they will get the same results as you get. And if there's a problem, you will notice. Okay. Um, so should we go to start? Yeah, a... and uh, maybe I can comment that, I mean, yeah. this will become a bit clearer during the lesson. I mean, it's a bit uh, hard for, uh, for newcomers to understand what cells are and so on, but uh, we'll demonstrate this, so. Oh, right, right, this true. This will uh, last a little bit. Yeah, we'll come back to it and clarify. Okay, so I will go to the terminal and start a uh, start Jupyter Lab. So first, let's make a new folder. Jupyter Lab demo, and then I. Um, I am in the code refiner environment, so I have everything installed already. Um, so I can run the command Jupyter Lab. Oh, there's many of these. Okay, Jupyter Lab. <coughs> now it opened. Okay, I do not want to receive news. Um, so it opened automatically in the browser window. Um, that's most recently open. It will do whatever your system's default is to open a browser window. And, uh, oh, well, let's go look, go, um, let's look through the interface. I will get the notes to the side again, because I again forgot to do that. So, uh, so here we are. Um, so Jupyter Lab is here uh, displaying in the browser. There is a notebook server that's running, essentially it's a process that's running in the terminal here. And you can see um, it's printing out some information that I cannot read. Um, but yeah, also, that, also is, yeah. that is not so important to understand. So the main uh, main focus is the, the browser interface. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, 
so yeah, essentially it's running on my, everything's running on my laptop here. But yeah, this, um, you see, uh, you interact with it through the browser. Um, okay, so now what do we have here? We have a file manager. We don't have any files currently, but uh, this, it lists all the files here. There's also um, a list of, well, I guess list of kernels, maybe we'll come back to what that means. Um, there's an, a tab for Git. So if this is a Git repository, you will see some information here. You can initialize a Git repository and then, or clone one into this folder. Um, table of contents of currently open notebook can be useful. And then extensions, which we will use at some point later. Okay, but I think the first thing to do is to create a notebook. So let's go create a notebook. Oh. Okay, the plus button just creates a new launcher tab here. So we can, we already have one. So let's then start a notebook. Okay, and this has no name. So um, what would be a better name for this example? Demo, demo. It's always best to rename your notebooks. The first thing you do when you open them. Who doesn't have lots of, well, who wants uh, untitled files on computer? Yeah. Um, and it's easy to forget because it doesn't even ask you for a name by default. Okay, so now we can type stuff into these cells. So let's start with um, a markdown cell. So this is a cell, first of all, <laughs> um, and I can start type stuff in. Um, so I'll type some markdown in. So how do, uh, how do you choose uh, whether it's markdown or uh, or if it's a code cell? Um, so actually this is currently code, mm -hmm. but I'm typing in markdown. So I need to go and click through here and select markdown. So now it is a markdown cell. Okay. Um, I'm not going to repeat the entire example notebook. I think we get it from a repository later. Um, so I'll just write some random equations here, or not random. Um, I'm not actually sure how to write um, an equation here, but it doesn't matter that much. Uh, so dollar signs, in between dollar signs. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll just run this. So to run this, um, I can press play here and it creates a new cell below. So when you run a markdown cell, it renders it. It displays the uh, the result of this markdown code. And then I can run Python code or write Python code. So let's do, um, what should I do? I'm, I'm import a module, import random. And what should I do? Random. <laughs> Let's get yeah, some results. I would from this. copy paste from our uh, lesson material. I would suggest this to our participants as well. Um, yes. Uh, if they want to play around later on. Yeah. So you, okay, you don't so... necessarily have to understand everything that is uh, in uh, in the call lines, but uh, just the general idea. Again, you can okay. use so it this... later. We have yeah. markdown cells. Um, so yeah, there is an example of markdown cells here. And um, so I'm going to copy, just paste into this, but um, we have already talked a good bit about Markdown. Here's again, examples of uh, Markdown equations. Uh, Jupyter understands this format for equations, um, this format that is, and um, some more um, formatting. So let's run that one. It's nice you can also include figures. I mean, images of any kind. That's yeah that's cool if you want to present something for others and you just want to show uh, well yeah some let's just from the, the web yeah let's just do a hello world here that's a good example okay okay so, so that cell is now uh, a code cell can you show again i mean how you change uh, uh the oh, well um, when you create a new cell it will by default be code mm -hmm. um so yeah, you can again go from here and make it a markdown cell, um, or you can make it a code cell. Yeah, and in this case, our interpreter is Python. Yeah, if right. we use yes, some other extension, uh, then uh, we could you 
write code in, I don't know, Julia or, uh, or R. But uh, right now yeah. we are using Python as an interpreter. Yeah. So I started this from Python, um, install it with from PyPy. So uh, it is um, by default, it's defaulting to Python. Um, but yeah, you can also have other kernels and choose other languages. Okay, so is there anything more on this? Um, anything else that's important in here? There's a keyboard shortcuts that are, if you start using notebooks extensively, Jupyter notebooks extensively, then these are um, useful shortcuts that you will probably learn sooner or later. And yeah. uh, then we have some uh, tools for debugging, testing, and writing code in notebooks are useful. Yeah, uh -huh. I only know a couple of shortcuts which I use all the time. And then uh, um, many other things I do uh, by clicking, which is not optimal. Yeah. But then again, I mean, it's uh, maybe I don't use Jupyter Lab enough so that uh, mm. so that it's uh, super useful. But yeah, creating new cells and uh, running things, uh, that's, uh, that's good to have shortcuts for. So yeah, essentially I know one shortcut, which is control enter to run a cell. <laughs> yeah. And maybe it's good to point that this may be different on different operating systems. Right. So uh, it may be control enter or uh, shift enter. Yeah. So it's, if um... you don't know, you can uh, check the settings you have for Jupyter lab and I think they will be uh, listed there. Yeah, at least here we have, um, command in parentheses but here we don't so I'm not sure which is which it is but it is either control or command depending on uh, on your system okay but I suppose we can move forward um, so in this example we um, essentially do what the notebooks are good for we write a narrative and we write some uh, we get some results and then Later, we publish this so that everyone else can view it and run the same code. OK, so should we explain this? Um, or how much should we explain this? So this is um, this is a way of calculating pi, um, but it is more useful as a demonstration um, than it is as an, as an actually a fast way of computing pi. So we're essentially on a com yeah, on the, lab, on, on the computer, we're throwing dice on a square, and then we are checking if they land inside the circle or not. And use the area of the square um, compared to the area of the circle to figure out what pi is. OK. So um, we start Jupyter Lab. We already did that. We created a new notebook, uh, which we also did. And right, okay, so you can also start Jupyter Lab without uh, automatically opening it in a browser. And then what you would do to open it in a browser is go to this this address, localhost 888. Yeah, so the moment you add this option, no browser, then you're going to yeah. get the, as an output well, among the, the output lines, a line with the URL that you can then open in your favorite browser. If you do not right. specify the no browser option, it's going to take your default browser. But if you want to have control over the window in which it opens, then uh, that's a good option yeah. to, uh, to use. OK, but yeah, let's go in the demo. So the first thing I'll do to make things easier is um, copy this um, iframe display and this is the address that I'm currently looking at. Um, so I will basically open this current website in a Jupyter notebook. Let's get rid of this hello world cell and also this cell. Well, um, I guess that one, that will cut. Let's make it a code cell, yes, and then run. Okay, so now we have a browser in Jupyter Lab in a browser. Great. 
and uh, start with creating a cell below that. So, and this is where we were. Um, okay, so the first thing we do, um, well, we have a header in Markdown. So let's make a Markdown cell. Uh, we have a cell, uh, but turn it into a Markdown cell. So calculating pi using Monte Carlo methods. Okay. Yeah, That's so now title. you're basically copy pasting uh, from uh, from the content of the cell uh, above. Yes. Okay, so and here are some the relevant formulas. I think we can put them in the same cell if you don't mind. Um, and an image that explains the concept which we had on the website. Yeah, I would Let's... put them in different cells, but that's just my preference. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do that. I think it well maybe at the beginning it's better to use different cells, and then uh, and then if you want to uh, condensate okay. a bit your. Uh, um, so I made a mistake. Um, hmm. What was the mistake? Um, I'm asking more the audience, but it's actually like this is not very this is not a very useful error message, I guess. Well, it looks like. Uh, let's see if uh, anyone else is actually in the, in the notes. Should we give them a minute and uh, so that they get the chance to tell us what the mistake Maybe. is in the. I Okay. The error message is really not useful. Well, I guess this is the key. Syntax error. Yeah, unexpected token. Right. Somebody yeah, exactly. Guessed. So someone did no, somebody tell us it. yeah. it's uh, it interpreted as a as a code cell. So basically, yeah. it's trying to to interpret that using Python, and uh, that is uh, yeah. I don't know why this is the first error. And how is this Python? Okay, fine. We interpret uh, the the first part is interpreted as comment, right? Yeah, this is a comment. Mm -hmm. But then there's this exclamation mark, and it's trying to take dots of that exclamation. Well, mm -hmm. okay. So for some reason, this is the first mistake it found. Um, that's not proper Python code. Okay, well, let's turn it into a Markdown cell and try again. So here's the image. So we are actually taking this square and then drawing random numbers inside it, or random coordinates inside the square. And if it is um, inside the square, then it is in the area of this quarter of a circle. Um, and otherwise it's only in the square. So the area of the quarter of a circle is, um, so the area of the quarter of a circle divided by the area of the circle is pi over four, is that right? I think so, yeah. Yes. Okay. Now we are far enough down that um, I can no longer see uh, the examples. I will start copying from the side, but um, do you still hope, um, I think you still know what's going on. So I will copy some, now this is supposed to be Python code, yes. This is Python code. So what we're doing is uh, importing modules that we need. We need random because we want random numbers. And then we also want to be plotting things. So let's import matplotlib. And I run that. Yes, and uh, if so, you're working in the code refinery environment, then uh, you will have uh, a matplotlib installed as a dependency. Yeah. Okay, and then we, um, well, okay, we decide how many points we will create for this test or for this uh, example. And then we start drawing dots. So that's, uh, there's a comment first, we'll draw dots, which means we draw two random numbers, an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Um, so first initial uh, list of points and the number of hits. <clears throat> then we do a for loop um, that just runs the same thing as many times as the number of points is. We draw two random numbers, x and y. So x and y equals random and random. And then if it is inside the circle, so if the square, sum of the squares, which is the distance from the origin is smaller than one, then it's a hit. 
and we append a point. Uh, the reason for appending these points is to create is, is to create this plot. So we are keeping track of the x coordinate, y coordinate, and of the point, and also the color. So inside the circle, it's red; otherwise, it's blue. Yeah, and this also I not... should yeah. If if you cannot follow uh, uh, this, then uh, it's not uh, very critical. Basically, we are copying uh, uh, different uh, parts of the Python script that we have, and uh, true. Yeah. interpreting uh, these different yeah. uh, cells. Um, so the main Python. point is not exactly what we are doing with the code, but rather how we are explaining the code and displaying the code. Um, so we, the, the code is divided in these cells and we are, right now we only have these comments here between them, but we could all have much more uh, formal text and description between them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I could in principle add a cell at the top of this one where I exemplify more in yeah. a, in a markdown cell what I'm actually achieving so we could do or trying to do um, the cell. Uh, with these different cells. So I'll turn it into a markdown cell and then we could have more explanation. Yeah. So something like this comment, but much more detail or uh, more formatting at least. Yeah. And, and this is especially useful this. if I'm going to share this later on uh, yeah. with people that don't actually understand Python. They still uh, know uh, more or less what uh, this uh, code does and what uh, well, what are the different steps. Yeah. OK, so uh, yeah, um, I also added this that adds a blue point when it doesn't hit, but it doesn't count it as a hit. OK, and I run it. <coughs> and finally, we have another section that plots the results. So we um, take the x, y points and colors, and we create a plot and show it. Well, actually, this actually finally creates the plot. So this will the, this will actually return a plot, and that plot then will be displayed here. OK, so it has the points inside the circle and outside the circle. And then um, one final step we haven't done yet. We haven't actually calculated the uh, pi. Um, so to do that, according to the equation above, um, you take the fraction of hits to the whole number of points and multiply by four. Okay. So pi is three fourteen something. Uh, uh, I don't uh, know actually so many digits, but uh, this is fairly close. Yeah, it's um, so, uh, three one four at value. least. So mm -hmm. yeah, close enough. So how you can, can we always improve? rerun and see. Yeah, how could I improve on uh, on this number, for example? Oh, you make it more accurate. Yeah. You mean, um, increasing the number of points, I guess, is the best thing. Mm -hmm. So this can... ran fairly quickly, so I suppose we can add a zero. But then, uh, well, now if I just run this. Nothing happens. So exactly. So uh, everything below. So how do uh, what should I do now? I mean, I could run all of these cells below, mm -hmm. and that will work, right? So now it made a big plot and lots of circles. This is closer, but yeah. well, I don't know if it does. Or much no, it's. it's just... <laughs> but I mean, it's a uh, it's a bit of oscillation. Uh, yeah. Uh, until uh, until uh, you get. Um, this number converged, so to say. But really, I guess what I would recommend doing, if I add another zero here, is clicking on this restart kernel and run all cells. So this will run the whole notebook from the beginning to the end. Yeah, and also it's it's especially useful to also restart the kernel and not just running all the cells uh, from the top to bottom. In case you have some uh, variables that you have defined, but then you remove the, the cells where, uh, uh, where they yeah. were defined, they may still be kept in the memory unless you actually restart the kernel. So restarting means erase uh, all um, variables from memory and uh, run the cells in order. Yeah, And it's very good practice to do this before you share your uh, notebook with anyone else. So essentially, I consider this now essentially done, although you could add a lot more story in between here. 
um, to actually explain what's going on, but at least the code is done. So at this point, it makes sense to rerun um, run the entire code again uh, with, from a fresh state. Okay. Um, so what do we get? Like, what's the point? We get the plot, so we could send that to someone. Um, or we can set, we can send the entire notebook as a single file to someone. If they know how to run JupyterLab, then they know what to do with that file, and they can reproduce everything. Um, they can even tweak the analysis a bit and um, and then send us back the notebook. Or even better, use version control, and uh, then we can edit it together to get some final result. Exactly, and that uh, is what we are going to be doing in the following. See how we can actually version control uh, our notebooks. Yeah. So yeah, this is so the essential point is this is the whole story. This is not just a code, and this is not just a plot, and also it's not just a description we write in the email. It contains all of those um, in one place. So that is that's a useful thing. Okay. So um, here I have the materials open, and the next section is notebooks and version control. <clears throat> okay, sorry. So um, I'm guessing we will then use version control to um, I'll put this notebook into version control and then maybe put it on GitHub. Or similar. Exactly, um, and, uh, and uh, in order to be able to uh, to um, um, to uh, show different, uh, uh, I mean, so, sorry, to show the dif uh, the the differences among different plots, then it's very important that we do have uh, uh, some um, uh, some uh, packages, additional packages installed, and that is uh, NBDime. Which is uh, yeah. a part as a sorry, it's a, a dependency in our uh, code refinery environment, and that is the reason why we have it so that uh, so um, we can uh, show these different uh, changes in the in the notebooks yeah. in a meaningful way. Yeah. So um, the notebook is stored as a JSON file. You don't necessarily exactly need to know what that is, but um, it's a text file. So it is a text file. You can version it. Um, but let's just take this notebook and open it in a text editor. So this is what it looks like. And mostly it looks fine. It looks like something that would go through version control, although you probably, maybe you still wouldn't want to look at this um, changes in this. Um, you would rather look at changes in this mm -hmm. format. But um, this is the bad part. Uh, this is the image. Um, so it's this image. And changes here will just be one huge bunch of changes. So that makes it quite unclear. And of, of course, like, there's a lot of metadata and all of that. So mm -hmm. um, looking at changes here might look very unclear. And you you do want a better interface. So um, should we try the NBDIME interface? Or do we just look at the comparison? So we are, at this, I think we should uh, uh, show how we can uh, initialize this uh, directory All as right, a git repository here. in JupyterLab. Yes, so here is JupyterLab okay. again. And here where we have this uh, folder view, we also have the git section. And I guess we click initialize repository. Exactly. So let's see what happens. Uh, yes, I do. OK. It's a checkpoint file. I don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah, so checkpoint is a um, temporary file that Jupyter Notebook um, uses, and I would actually ignore that file. So I would, yeah. uh, there is an option just to click on that and uh, add it to git ignore. So, so right click uh, and add file. to git ignore. Okay, that's yeah. nice. That's convenient. Okay. okay. So and I did create a new file because I didn't have a git ignore file before. Exactly. And added it here. Okay, so that's nice. I will close okay. the Git ignore file. And then file for now. Uh, what we want is to track this change. Yeah. So uh, now these are both untracked. So I guess, is it this one? No, this one. 
plus button mm -hmm. also i suppose this one yes for an initial commit okay so now we can write our commit message and the description if we want yeah. i'm doing two, two changes at the same time but also this is the first commit so it this is the whole repository okay okay so now there's nothing staged nothing changed nothing untracked it's all there Okay, so we, we have our very history. first commit on the master branch. Yes. It so may be branch. the main branch for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that all? Um, and now I should make a change to the notebook. So what should I change? I guess um, like this is a big plot. There's too many points. Yeah. I want to make uh, it smaller before I. Um, let's do that. And then Maybe rerun we... the whole thing. So, um... You share this with someone else. You don't want it unnecessarily heavy. Yeah. So... I could also remove this iframe. Mm -hmm. Let's do that too. And uh, I didn't change the code, but still I do want to rerun the whole thing. Yeah. Oops. It's always a good idea before saving. Yeah. Then save so and... Yeah, it looks nice. Okay, so now I have some changes. And here is diff this file. So what does this look like? Um, maybe... Okay, okay maybe so one difference this. is that the iframe is gone. Yeah. So um, what is this saying? So this, it's uh, the difference between your current head. version to the right and then the head, yeah. which was your previous commit. So I that is what if, if it weirder. was wider, would this look better at the top here? I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, always There's tricky with wrong, narrow yeah. windows. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, and then there's the change in the number of points. Everything else looks roughly the same, but then there is this plot that has changed. Yeah. And also the result. Exactly. So the green one is uh, the current version green and the red one, red the red old. labeled one is uh, the one of our previous commit. Because okay. that is what we are comparing against in this case. Yeah. So useful, useful for to have yeah. this MBDime for uh, plots. Okay. So now... Um... Here's the Git interface. Let's add this. Reduce the number of points and commit. Okay. So yeah, now we are tracking this on Git, and um, and we have a nice interface for looking at the changes in the files. Okay. Um, there's also a point here in the notes. Um. Well, first a point about GitHub. So uh, do I have a GitHub page open? Not right now. I will open one. So GitHub has an a feature. Oh no, not there. No, it's on your picture. So if you click yeah, on your you picture. The picture mm -hmm. And then you need to go to uh, feature, feature preview. preview. So and reach to be the notebook devs. Yeah, so this is so uncommented it, by default. Uh, I mean, no, sorry, not, it is disabled by default, and then you can yeah. activate it if you, if you so have if you, containing notebooks. So if you don't have this active, it will look like uh, the diff if of, of the JSON file, which is not easy to read. Um, if you have it enabled, then it will use a, the NB9 to display the difference. So yeah, this is uh, it's good to enable this one. There is also um, here. Yeah, we have an example in our lesson material. Just ah, okay. higher up. I oh. think it would be nice to show it. So yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, just above the reach Jupyter notebooks notebook diff. Uh, this a bit one. Higher up, yes. A bit higher oh. up. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you have the link there uh, where you have this uh, comparison between the two. Okay. No bits uh, lower. Just ah, 35% from the top. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this goes to a GitHub, uh, a comparison of two different notebooks. And they have changed red to orange and said change the size of the plot. And then the plot is does look different. Um, so do, should I demonstrate this with the... Um, yeah, why not? With the rich diff off. So this is, it might look like this. Um, so if you see a notebook, a difference between notebooks looking like this, and it's hard to read, then, um, oh, this is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> Loads of image data. Okay. Imagine so you then you want to turn this fingers. on. <laughs> yeah. So I'm turning it back on. Okay. So that's a useful feature. Um, also, you can turn the same thing on in Git uh, on your command line by default. Or um, I think this essentially applies to most places where you use Git, as long as it is Git that's actually opening the difference and oh, displaying the difference. So uh, you can run this command on the command line and it will use NB time when you do uh, differences of notebooks. I will not demonstrate this though, because in, I have nbdime in the code refinery environment, but it might break Git otherwise. So you need to have nbdime installed for this to work, and I don't. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah so... there's also this um, Git friendly Jupyter notebooks from the nbdev, which is a nice um, option. on different way of essentially achieving the same thing. Um, and this uh, JupyterLab extension that records history. So that's also useful. Okay. Um, should we, what do you think? Should we have the break before the Yeah, I think that's notebooks? a good uh, break to, um, and then, it's a good it's a good time to have a break and then we can go uh, into uh, sharing notebooks and working with binder just after the break so um i suggest um 10 minutes and then free pass the the hour then uh, we are back with that yeah so, so there was just a question of what is np time which i guess so we showed this difference uh in notebooks but we didn't actually say that it's and oh, we did say that it's np time but not like most of the time it's hidden. So NB dime is what is actually uh, display, uh, creating this difference between the notebooks so that it looks like this and it looks like this rather than looking like this. So this is NB dime. Yeah, so it's actually a, a PyPy package. But in this case, actually, you can also install it with Conda. So it's one a dependency that we have in our environment, which allows us to um, to uh, show these differences in the plots yeah. in uh, in a uh, in a easy to uh, view way, a visually nice uh, way of doing yeah. the differences. Okay, um, should we say well, let's do ten minutes. Um, so back at four past, mm -hmm. five past. Why not five past? Eleven minutes. That's fine. Okay, then let's give them an extra yeah. minute. Yes, let's yeah. do that. All right. So have a good break. Bye. Okay. Hey, welcome back. Hope you had a good break. So anything to bring up in the notes? So yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Please. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, we do need a couple of uh, dependencies to uh, to make uh, this uh, lesson material work. So as we mentioned, well, we have uh, Jupyter Lab uh, and also the NBDime um, extension, uh, sorry, um, package that uh, that allows us to uh, to um, 
to do uh, the diffs between uh, different plots and um, maybe you do not have that installed and then uh, we recommend that uh, you just uh, watch this as a demo later on maybe you want to set that up if you work a lot with python and then uh, then you can uh, try again on your own so essentially like what you might have might be missing is jupyter lab uh, git jupyter lab minus git and then nb dime um, so you can try installing those later and then um, redoing the, the demonstration yourself. Okay, so the next section is sharing uh, Jupyter, uh, sharing Jupyter notebooks or sharing notebooks. So um, when have you shared code? Yes. Um, you think of situations where where you have had to share some code. Um, so have you shared code to yourself so that you can work on two different computers? That's of course a common issue. Have you maybe shared um, to a larger audience on a website or in some other way? Or to a colleague where you possibly both want to make some changes? So of course, last week, the whole week, we were talking about Git, and that solves exactly this problem in all of those situations, right? Um, and NVDime is helpful, and you can use Git with Jupyter Notebooks. But um, one thing that Git doesn't allow you to do uh, is editing the same file at the same time. You will at least need to be editing on your side offline and then sharing, committing and sharing. Um, and yeah, there's a, a bunch of a number of different ways of sharing these notebooks that might be useful in some of these situations. So what should we say about this? Um, so I uh, and there are many different uh, options uh, and different ways to share a notebook, and we have listed the, the ones uh, we know uh, about in the lesson material. Yeah. Uh, I would say that my preferred way is uh, putting it on GitHub, but of course you can put it on other platforms uh, that uh, that uh, you prefer. And then I do like to use that uh, to, in uh, connection with uh, uh, in connection to Binder and share yeah. uh, notebooks that way. So we'll demonstrate Binder. That's nice. Um, there's also Notebook Viewer, kind of similar. Um, and yeah, Jupyter Lab now does support this collaborative shared editing, so you can edit the same notebook at the same time. Yeah, that's so, also so nice. That, that is yeah. that is useful. Um, but yeah, for long term, definitely um, a good repository binder is also what I do. Um, but oh yeah, there's a, a bunch of options that you can look through and see what works for you. Okay. Um, oh, here's some other options, the commercial options that have pre plans. Okay, but let's go to Binder. Um, so um, the first thing, if you want to share your code um, so that people can edit it on Binder, I guess I think the first thing you have to do is you have to share the code. Um, you have to get it online. So let's do that. Yeah, so we'll use uh, GitHub to um to uh, create a repository uh, and uh, and uh, track this uh, so I have a, this uh, oh, so Jupyter yeah. notebook. Yeah. I guess I will go. Oh, there I can create a new repository. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that I that I share my new notebook that I wrote in the last hour. Um, I will share it to this repository. Okay, so what should I call it? Let's just, this was called, um, oh, the notebook I just created was called demo.ipython notebook, so. Yeah, but you can have binder demo or whatever. 
<laughs> yeah, bind the demo okay. makes sense. And I'll add a readme file. I already have a git ignore file in the repository, so I don't want that one. Um, I'll just use MIT license. I'm not going to keep this for very long, I think. So um, having a license may be a bit um, extra, but I like to do it. Um, okay. okay, so then we upload the files that we already have. Uh, the notebook files, if I find here. Add yeah, file. so we click on that plus button next to code and upload files because we already have these saved on our local computers. Otherwise, you can edit it on uh, GitHub as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then choose files. And then I have to find source, code refinery, JupyterLab demo, demo notebook. It doesn't list the GitHub. Oh, what is happening? Okay. Um, it's a because hidden it starts file. with a dot, so it's a hidden file. Mm -hmm. So here we go. There's also dot git and dot. Okay. So can I? I think you can only do files? one at a time. I'm not sure. Yeah. Let's try. Huh? Okay. Very good. <laughs> Upload demo notebook. Okay. okay. And now we have the two files, demo notebook and git ignore, and a pretty empty readme file. Okay, so what do we need? Well, what do we need? We need, um, we need a requirements file, right? Exactly. So, so that yeah, binder so... knows what packages to install. So let's create a new file. And the, in this case, we'll create a normal text file and not upload. Okay, and add matplotlib, the specific version for, actually, I don't know if this is the version I have there. I guess in the code refinery environment, I assume we have this version because this is in the nodes. But um, probably the exact version doesn't matter. Oh, this needs to be called requirements.txt. Yes. So that or you can also work is... with uh, with uh, environment YAML, but then the syntax is a bit uh, different. Yeah. So if Binder sees a requirements.txt file in the repository, it knows this is Python code, and then it will install the libraries mentioned in the file. In an environment.yaml, for example, you can require Python and or you know you can add Python as a dependency, or you can add R or whichever you want. Um, as long as it's available on Conda. Okay. And um, I'll quickly show in the notes. Um, no, 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 here. So um, for Python, Jupyter Notebooks, this is what you need, or um, environment.yaml, but there is also R, R Markdown, R Studio Notebooks. And there you have this runtime.txt instead. So otherwise it's similar. There are some different requirements for the notebook because it would use different plotting libraries, our libraries. Okay. This okay. is the notebook, this is the GitHub page. Okay, so commit to changes. <coughs> okay, is that all we need? I think so. It is. So now the question is how then how can we link this to binder or how yes. we can use uh, to show this uh, this notebook in binder yeah so for that we need to go to a, a start open a new browser a new tab and go to my binder dot org it's trying to fill in something uh, another repository but i'll just go to my binder dot org mm -hmm. Okay, and then here you can fill in your uh, GitHub repository name or URL. Um, so maybe you could show that you can actually work with other platforms. If you click on the down arrow, uh, arrow next to GitHub, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so you can choose from SGS. different ones where you have your notebooks. Yeah. The Zenodo ones are uh, nice because you also have a DOI, a yeah. digital object uh, identifier. So that may be useful, especially if you want to refer to them uh, uh, in papers. Mm. Yeah, but we'll use GitHub today. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes. It's good that you can connect to a lot of things. There's all, even a general Git repository, you just need to have an HTTP server pointed at that point to that Git repository. Okay, so um, I will use the URL from here. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go to the, to the main page first. Okay, so then you just copy paste the yeah. main page of the repository. Yeah. yeah. Please okay. make sure that you don't have the branch name in that name yeah, that comes right. later. Yeah, sometimes, especially if you create a new file, it actually goes to where I just was, which is tree slash main mm -hmm. slash main and that I think will not work because okay. that is actually defined in the next uh, uh, right yes line. you can give them a, a branch name or a tag here or a co even a commit ID anything committee anything that points to a commit by yeah. default it will take the whatever happens to be the default when you clone it which is the main branch yeah, exactly. Um, you can define the default branch, but yeah. in our case, it's uh, it's the main branch on uh, GitHub. Yeah, and, the and then it's just the um, latest commit. Yeah, and then you can give the path of the notebook file that you want it to open by default. You can have multiple notebook files, and it will have a file browser. But um, in this case, we have a single notebook file, so we want to open it by default. Default. So demo dot demo.ipython notebook, okay. And yeah. I can launch it from here. And then I can also, also, so exactly. Yeah. So this URL that you get is very useful actually if you want to share it with others. And uh, I suggest that we also add it to our readme on the GitHub repository. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that way, whomever is going through your code can uh, also see an instance of yeah. this. Uh, so let's go back to GitHub. So and we can add it to the readme here. Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> there is also a badge <coughs> that does the same thing, because in the previous session we were talking about badges a little bit. So this is for Markdown. So let's add it again. <laughs> and um, this is the this is a URL, um, and the batch is actually a link that points to the same URL, but it's an image. Okay. So now it looks like this. Both of these are links, so it doesn't really matter. They point to the same thing. This is just it, this looks a bit nicer. Well, it depends on what you prefer, but. Um, uh, so from here, you can then directly launch. Um, so I could click the launch button here, fill in the information. But instead, I'm going to click the launch button from here. Well, there we go. And again, it might take a while. Now, it only has one dependency to install, but it actually sets up the whole system. Um, Actually, it's pretty quick. It's now it's installing Matplotlib, so it's pretty far already. Mm -hmm. So this will uh, fire up a container on the cloud with uh, the with Jupiter and uh, with Jupiter Lab and uh, and the dependencies that you have in your uh, in your requirements file. It also has a preview of the file here. Yes, for the impatient ones. That's uh, very yeah. useful. That you know. I just uh, can't run it yet. But yeah, you know what to, to run expect it, I have to wait. when it's going to fire yeah. up. Okay, so. Um, what do we do while we wait? Um, 
Am I can also I too suggest impatient? we well we can check the the preview? Yeah. This one. Yeah. So it's basically what we had uh, in our local notebook. Yeah. Any questions, comments? So they are all answered, but I mean, of course, the question is uh, when to just have um, the notebooks on your own computer and when you actually want to have them on Binder. And I think that uh, it is always good to have your uh, your uh, codes or notebooks uh, saved on uh, on uh, some other platform. Mm. And uh, and maybe you are not ready to share. Uh, them with uh, with your colleagues yet, but uh, but it's a good uh, it's good for you to reference uh, later on, and uh, when you are ready to uh, share them with others, then uh, then uh, you can do that. So uh... yeah, I guess essentially, of course, I've been using these these tools for a while, but at this point, I would never really have a code that's at least more than an our old that's only on my laptop that feels very insecure like it might crash at any moment and i might lose all of that hour of work so i will push it to some online repository now there are options for private repositories um most universal many institutions will have their own um uh gitlab instance for example so that it's a good good option to check that out. And yeah, GitHub does have private repositories, and so does GitLab. So um, those are also options. Or yeah. you can run a server and run um, like push your changes to that server. That's always also an option. Yeah. So now uh, what's opened is a um, browser window. And uh, the backbone of this is actually the cloud instance that you have on uh, Binder. Yeah. It's just that it's using your uh, browser interface to uh, visualize the notebook. So uh, we can inspect this notebook and uh, what happens if we make uh, changes to this notebook? Let's say that one of the collaborators comes, they, he or she got this URL from you and wants to mm -hmm. make changes to the notebook or just play around and maybe, I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean... I guess the big thing in Binder is that you can run the code, first of all. So um, I can go through and run the process. It, it's it's somewhere running somewhere on the cloud. So mm -hmm. now I'm just redoing the same thing. Yeah, so the advantage is that they don't oh, even need to fine. have JupyterLab installed on their computer. They can just run it on the, on the cloud. So that's fun. Something went wrong. Um, something went wrong in the plotting. Uh, could we miss dependencies? Um, it's could complaining it? about NumPy infinities somehow. It happens every time though. Oh, so here, there's a deprecated thing. So I, I think the dependencies oh, we one. have installed are conflicting with, it, with each other. Mm -hmm. The matplotlib and the numpy. Yeah, well, we have not uh, really listed numpy as the dependency, so we would need to go no. back to our requirements file and add that. Yeah, so we don't really have time to do that, I think. So, um, but this will clearly demonstrate that we did run this on the cloud, mm. and uh... <clears throat> and interestingly, it didn't actually work. Except, but we did get the result in the end in the end i can try to um add something to the code um, yeah and the advantage uh well um and then run it so yeah it is actually you can make changes to the code and it will run the code that you see 
Exactly, and this is not going to change your original file on uh, GitHub. So this is all done in this uh, cloud instance and you may modify it uh, as, uh, as much as you want. But if you do want to save uh, changes to uh, to you uh, to this notebook, how can you do that? If I do want to save the changes, mm -hmm. I so you have actually... a great idea, and then uh, hmm. and then uh, you want. It to looks like I can do it. something with GitHub. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I think there is a file. Binder. If you go to File, the top okay. menu, and then Save as. Oh, okay. And Save however notebook. you want to or download you can also click on download yes and that will uh, actually save it so on your download almost computer. certainly actually downloads the notebook yes yes so um, that is one way of saving it to your computer and then you will still have to open that uh, notebook in an environment which has the yeah. dependencies that you need right so, so i only get the notebook i don't mm -hmm. i don't get the environment when i download the notebook yeah. This is restore from browser storage. So actually, so I can save it to browser storage, which means it will be saved in in this web browser, and then I can get it from there. So I can save it locally relatively easily. Yeah. Then I can reload the page. My changes are gone, but then I can pick this one and get the, the, the notebook. The download option is also here. Yeah. That download visible. So it downloads the currently visible notebook. Also, if you, <coughs> if you only store it in the browser uh, storage and then you clean up your uh, your uh, browser data every once in a while, then uh, you are going to lose that. So. Uh, hmm. Yeah. So it's not there. permanent storage. One thing that I would really like actually is to be able to just save this to a GitHub repository, but that's not here yet. Yeah, uh, so of course you can uh, you can visit the GitHub repository, uh, and you have a link uh, yeah. to that from the uh, from the top menu, and yeah. you may uh, you may clone that repository oh, or fork it yeah. to uh, an instance. Uh, to uh, oh. fork it to a repository in your own um, uh, GitHub. Yeah. So then you can uh, change it and version control it uh, as you need. Okay. Um. Well, we are running out of time very quickly. Yeah. Um. So I think that's all for the Jupiter lesson. And uh, feedback is already happening in the notes. So let's go to uh, outro and, uh, and thank talk you all about for... what's up tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you all for all the questions. And sorry, we didn't bring all of them up. But we are very, uh, very glad that, uh, that you all active. Yeah, I think this went. Richard? Very... Hi, uh, can you hear me? Now you can hear me. Yeah. yeah, I think this went very well. Um, yeah, so hopefully you enjoyed this day. I guess you saw a lot more ways to use version control in different things. So I guess the pattern here is basically once you're using Git or really any version control, there's all these other things you can build on top of it. And tomorrow this continues. So it's sort of the capstone days, I guess you could say. The first lesson is automated testing, where we see how we can write things in the code, which will automatically check the code and see if it works for um, other, what's it called? Like, see if it works, like basically find problems automatically, which is really useful, especially when we're scientists and stuff really needs to work. And the last one is modular code development, where we'll basically take one of the um, a simple toy problem and we'll go through a whole process of we start with Jupyter and then we make it a little bit more modular with functions and discuss why. We do a little bit more, we move to the command line and so on. Um, 
yeah, and this sort of is a summary of many of these things. Um, so again, tomorrow is demo based. So I see one of the feedback things says more uh, hands-on things would be nice. Unfortunately, there's so many different variables here. We can't make an exercise that would work in a short enough time just by answering our things. But we really recommend you take the afternoon now and go work on some of these different exercises. You can even write your questions in the notes and we'll keep seeing it by tomorrow at least, if not already today when we're answering it, or ask your colleagues and so on to be the mentors to do these things. Is there anything else? Um, yeah, okay, someone's writing in the news there. Um, yeah, is there anything else? Or should we call it good? No, not really. I mean, just mentioning again that if you have another tool which is your favorite you can do most of it uh, uh, using that tool i mean be it visual studio code or be it uh, um, uh, pluto i think it is for julia i mean there are many different uh, many yeah. different tools and uh, and you don't have to uh, do uh, you don't have to uh, use our python examples you can work with uh, with your Fortran codes, or you can uh, you can work with the workflow that you want to develop. So it's it's very flexible in that sense when it comes to yeah. to the language that you're using. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah, like following up on that, it's like this question number forty six down below. Are there any tutorials for these things? So we're basically inspiring you for what you can look at and. For most of these tools, they have their own tutorials and probably other tutorials around you can find. And you can um, yeah, just look and see what you find that fits your needs and all. And Exactly. So both Jupyter Lab and Binder have good documentation. So I would, I think the first thing to do if you don't know something is to Google for it and see <laughs> mm -hmm. what you get. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, or ask uh, ask your colleagues, but Google is a very good friend most yeah. of the times. So. Yeah. Okay, so should we call the day done? Is there anything else we need to address here? I think it's good. Thank you all for uh, being with us, and uh, thank you for the feedback. And uh, hopefully, you're going to join us tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. See you so, yeah, tomorrow. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.